Welcome to the Contending for the Word podcast, a podcast devoted to helping inform, educate, equip, and warn people about false teachers, false movements, and unbiblical philosophies. Now join our host for today's episode and enjoy. When I was first saved, I was a big fan of Joyce Meyer. I thought, this is the type of woman I want to be. And so I started watching her television broadcasts daily. I even started sending her money and uh, I was all in. She held a Bible. She was confident. She had huge audiences. What could be the problem? Well, the problem was that she's teaching with twisted scripture. As we're going to find out today, I was fooled, but there's ways for you to avoid being fooled by Joyce Meyer or other false teachers as our brother in Christ and dear friend, the theologian, Dave Jenkins, Executive Director of Servants of Grace, who's going to be talking about how we can avoid being fooled by false teachings. And he will be discussing his new book, The Word Matters, Defending Biblical Authority Against the Spirit of the Age. He'll talk about what the spirit of the age is, and he will show us how we can make sure that the teachings we're following aren't just feel-good false promises, but are actually based on God's word. Dave, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, it's so good always to be with you, Doreen. Well, Dave, I feel kind of embarrassed, ashamed that I was fooled by Joyce Meyer for so long, and I sent her so much money. Uh, And I just want to enlist your help and this new book, The Word Matters, so that people who are watching this video who might be have seduced by a false teacher, they can understand why that teaching is false. And also, you and I often encourage people to compare everything to scripture, to be a Berean, as Acts 17.11 exhorts us to be. And so we want to show practical examples of what that means when you say compare everything to scripture. Mm, Yeah, that's so important because... Uh, Joyce Meyer, other people, they, they, as we'll see today, they, they take an idea, even, even some, what we'll see, even 95% of maybe what she'd say was good. And then, but the last sentence, as we'll see in one of these things is all bad. I mean, it's heretical. So you can have the, you can have the principle be good, but then, um, the application, the interpretation can be all bad. That's how, when, when we're talking about, you know, theology, that's why it's so important that we're clear and that we're helpful and obviously that we're grounded in God's word. Um, sometimes you're going to have to read these things a little bit slower to be able to pick up on some of the things that, um, you know, like with Joyce Meyer or other people, uh, Derek Prince that we've talked about and, and all these people, they'll, they'll seduce you with sound. They'll get enough right where you're like, Oh, that sounds good. And then bam, they're going to come in and, you know, they hit you with their bad doctrine. And you're like, uh, you don't even, maybe you don't even notice. And, um, it's, it's, uh, people, even people that are strongly biblically, b- biblically and theologically solid can be seduced by this because they know how to craft a sentence and they know how to craft words, but it's a cunning thing. Um, it's so, so important that you know your Bible, that you can, you're reading it, that you're studying it, that you're memorizing it, that you're hearing it preached at, at your local church. Because these, these guys, these gals are all over the internet. Um, they, they want your, they, they'll go straight for your pocketbook. They won't go straight for your heart. And if they're not going straight for your heart with a word and they're going for your pocketbook, that's when you should really pay attention. All they want to do is line, line their pocketbooks, get more money. Here's an example of Joyce Meyer. This is an old um, audio of hers and an old book of hers. And our sister in Christ, Emily Massey, who used to work for Joyce Meyer Ministries, along with her husband, Paul Massey has kept up with what's going on with uh, Joyce Meyer's ministry, even though Emily and Paul, praise the Lord, have been saved out of word of faith, and they're now solidly in God's word. But they've kept up enough to know that there's no record of Joyce renouncing what she's teaching here. This is shocking. This is a page from 
Joyce Meyer's book, The Most Important Decision. And it's supposed to be like an altar call book. And you can see this is from We Would Rather Have Jesus. That's Paul and Emily Massey's uh, Instagram account. We will put the link in the description below so you can follow them as well, because having worked for Joyce Meyer, they have a lot of information that's very helpful if you are coming out of that false teaching and you need some support. They even have an online support group for former Word of Faith, NAR, and New Agers. So take a look at this book uh, page. It's, it's Joyce Meyer here is talking about that Jesus was the first born again man in hell. In, in the following audio, you will hear Joyce Meyer talk about Jesus in hell. And then Dave will explain why this is not biblical. In fact, why this is heretical and blasphemous. Buckle your seatbelts. This is pretty shocking. He could have helped himself up until the point where he said, I commend my spirit into your hands. At that point, he couldn't do nothing for himself anymore. He had become sin. He was no longer the son of God. He was sin. The devil thought he had him. The devil thought he'd won. Oh, they were having the biggest party that would ever been had. They had my Jesus in the floor, and they were standing on his back, jumping up and down laughing, and he had become sin. Don't you think that God was pacing, wanting to put a stop to what was going on? All the hosts of hell were up on him. Up on him. Up on him. The angels are in agony. All the creation is groaning. All the host of hell was upon him. Up on him. They got on him. They got him down in the floor and got on him. And they were laughing and mocking. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You trusted God and look where you ended up. You thought he'd save you and get you off that cross. He didn't. Ha, ha, ha. Do you know something? The minute that blood sacrifice was accepted, Jesus was the first human being that was ever born again. Now, it was sealed. I mean, it happened when he was in hell. Dave, that's just shocking. I didn't hear her say that or read that when I was first saved and following her. Uh, I, I would like to think that if I'd heard that, I would have recognized her false teachings. But a lot of people apparently just believe everything she says. How can they not be fooled? And then could you break down what she said for those who have been fooled? I think that people who follow Joyce Meyer and Joyce Meyer herself read the Bible as they want it to be. So when you read the Bible as you want it to be, what's going to happen is you're going to lay a meaning over the text that the text doesn't say. And uh, it's tragic because what people would hear is, oh, this sounds good at the beginning. But then you got to pay attention to what the rest of what the teacher is saying. Um, and if you don't, if all you hear is, oh, she quoted a Bible verse. And so that's what it means. Well, that's not what that means. Um, this is why interpretation matters. It matters the teaching that you hear um, and why you should pay attention to it. So hopefully that's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you. The It's shocking that she's talking about demons basically stomping on Jesus and laughing at him. Uh, it's just the, the dramatization of her own. It's, it's like a fantasy or just she's made this up and then she's dramatized it. Uh, it's, I, I don't know. I'm just shocked that anyone would say that and anyone would believe it. And now what we're seeing in that short clip, she's assigning a meaning to what scripture would say about some things um, that scripture doesn't support, namely that Jesus was, you know, the first born again man. Um, you know, and she also talks about as as well about uh, going Jesus going to hell um, and our redemption being paid by Jesus in hell. But that's that's there's nothing in the Bible that says that um, he prayed the price um, uh, for our sin in our place uh, on the cross. In John 1930, he says, Jesus says it is finished. Um, Colossians 120 says, and through him. Uh, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Colossians 2.14, 
by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to a cross. Uh, 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. Uh, the Bible doesn't teach what Joyce Meyer is saying, but it does say that Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. Ephesians 4 9 says, and saying he ascended, what does it mean that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? This can mean that Jesus was physically buried, which he was, or that Jesus went to Hades to inform those who had already died about who he was and what he did on the cross. Or it can be referring to the incarnation of Christ as is contrasted uh, with his ascending into heaven. Ephesians 4.10 says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? But there's no reason to believe that Jesus suffered in hell and finished his atonement there, as Joyce Meyer is saying. She's saying that you cannot be saved from your sins unless you believe that Jesus went to hell, the place that we deserve to go to apart from him. That's a false gospel. Um the gospel, though, in the given as clearly as it is anywhere in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it states that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Nowhere in Scripture are we told to believe that Jesus suffered for us in hell or that he went there. That's not only wrong, it's heretical. Now, what I mean by that, error is anything outside of the Bible. So what Joyce Meyer is teaching is outside of what the Bible says. I already explained that. To say that it's heresy, though, means that it's not only outside of what Scripture says, but it's also outside of what the church has taught about the Bible and biblical truth. That means that what she's saying is not only not biblically solid, it is not orthodox. It does not cohere with what uh, Christian orthodoxy says. That means that she's engaging in heresy. But false teachers are pronouncing, make false pronouncements. Mm -hmm. They have false theology. They don't have your best in mind. They have their best in mind. And they have the dollar bills sign as the forefront of everything. That's so true. Very Genesis 3, especially when you say crafty and cunning like the serpent. All right. Well, some of the false teachings that I fell for seem to be subtle. But remember, I came out of Christian science, which was the same thing where um, Mary Baker Eddy said we could only read from the King James Version Bible, and it's a beautiful translation, but I'm sorry, as a kid, I could not understand, even as an adult, I couldn't understand the Old English. Um, case in point, it says, no, you know, necromancy is a sin. Even Mary Baker Eddy of Christian Science says necromancy is a sin. And then I became one because I didn't even know what that word meant. You know, it was like a, these archaic words. It, and so, uh, I was raised that we cherry pick the Bible and then we make it all about ourselves. In the case of Christian science, it was all about how to heal your body. In the case of Joy, Joyce Meyer, it's all about the prosperity gospel. So let's take a look at one of her subtle examples. Galatians 6. You know, I like this because I feel like this puts power in my hands. I feel like, man, this has given me some authority. This has given me some power. I can change some things in my life if I'll just begin to give away what I want. That's really what that means. Give away what you want. Wow. Wow, wow, and double wow. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Give away what you want. Do not be deceived and deluded and misled, verse 7. God will not allow himself to be sneered at, scorned, disdained, or mocked by mere pretensions or professions, or by his precepts being set aside. He inevitably deludes himself who attempts to delude God. For whatever a man sows, that and that only is what he will reap. He who sows to his flesh, lower nature, sensuality, will from the flesh reap decay and ruin and destruction. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time, <laughs> and at the appointed season, we shall reap if we do not faint 
relax our courage, quit, and give up. I may not get my reward from the person I'd like to get it from, but God will get it to me one way or the other. If it don't come in the front door, it'll come in the back door. And if it can't come through a window, it'll come down the chimney. Those that come to God must believe that He is. And that He is the rewarder. The rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Everything in our life is a seed. Every attitude, every action, every thought, all of our words, every prayer. The Word of God is called seed that's planted in our heart. When it's watered and nourished, it grows up and becomes fruit-bearing trees of righteousness. The money that we give is called seed. We take that seed and we plant it in the ground of God's kingdom. And it brings a harvest in our own life. Uh, that was the kind of thing I would fall for, Dave, before I started studying the Bible. But it just struck me as she's talking, notice where, notice where the emphasis is in her discussion there. Notice how it's on God is the rewarder of all things. Now, what I want you to see here in verse 8 of Galatians 6 is, I'm going to read it for you, Galatians 6, 8. Galatians 6, 8 says, For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And emphasis matters. Um, she never even talked about at all in that clip about eternal life. And that's Paul's like main thing that he's talking about over and against material blessing. Um, he's talking not about temporal blessing. He's talking about the blessing of eternal life that, you know, as we believe we will reap as a result of sowing life to the spirit. Uh, Paul says this in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.17 for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And so this sets the believer's expectation and experience in this life that we will experience persecution. We will experience affliction. But this is a light momentary affliction that's preparing us for um, an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. In, in John 16, 33, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Notice it wasn't um, me and it wasn't Joyce Meyer. It wasn't anybody else that did it. It was God. Jesus is the one who's overcome the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the one that he will reward us. Now, we're, we're not denying that reality because Jesus talks about much about fruit. He next to talking about hell, he talks uh, secondarily about stewardship um, and he talks about, you know, rewards and those things. But in this passage that Joyce is discussing here, Paul is not talking primarily about temporal benefits this is why the word of faith is wrong they're getting excited about the word reap sounds biblical that you're going to reap this harvest of abundance and she's talking about sowing a seed in, into her ministry is really what they say you know give money to my ministry and then god is guaranteed to give you a blessing of a reward so jesus talking about reward um that's the afterlife that's not here getting a lot of money jesus never promised that Exactly, exactly. You know, Jesus in Matthew 6.33 tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added to you. That again isn't about us. Mm -hmm. If we read ourselves into that passage, then yeah, it's it's all about me. But notice what Jesus says. We're to seek him. Seek him, not seek me, not seek my benefits, seek my reward. And so what, what Joyce did in that passage is she... Essentially, what I'll say is she flipped Paul's words on his head and suggested instead that God is the primarily a rewarder of those who just trust him and declare and believe their uh, blessing. But but that actually literally does um, 
it's it's a criminal i'll say it this way it's a criminal interpretation of that passage because the the way in which we interpret the bible what it does is it reveals what we think about the bible and there's no better display of that when we look at this uh we just saw in that clip because the the passage under consideration is arguing against material blessings temporal blessings things in the here and now being blessed by god for instead uh just believing it and it, and it will happen as if i can somehow manifest the things that i want when whenever i want them that's that's what's so dangerous about you know word of faith and the prosperity gospel it makes me at the center um and and that's not a gospel there's no gospel there there's no discussion of what it does is it is it minimizes it marginalizes um it obliterates our the nature of sin our need for the grace of God, our need for one another, our need for accountability. Um, it, it diminishes the role of the church, which, by the way, um, I don't know if anybody noticed in that clip, but there's men in that audience. Oh, yeah. She's addressing men in a mixed gathering. She is preaching to men. And I don't know if everybody's familiar, but First Timothy 2.12 does apply there mm-hmm. in a mixed gathering. But the fact is, irregardless of that, she is preaching to um men in a mixed gathering whether that's a church service or not um that's still um wrong and it mm-hmm. shouldn't happen and she's doing that so so she's undermined now she suggests i know this um because i'm familiar uh, in this way with joyce meyer because she said it so many times over the years um she suggests that because she is under the headship of her husband that it's okay um, and it's not okay, Joyce. It's not okay. It's not okay. Yes, you should submit to your husband. Yes, you are joint heirs with Christ and you mutually submit to one another with Christ as a head and your husband leading you as unto Christ. But that doesn't mean then by extension there, then that you can somehow teach other, other men. That makes no sense. That's, that's totally again, twisting. Um, the nature of church leadership, it's minimizing the God-given roles between a man and a woman within, um, w- within the created order and, 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 and on and on you go. So, so you have already f- one example and you already have uh, a flipping of the text on its head to mean something else. Um, and in this case, it's all word of faith. So you minimize sin. It's all about me. That's all about mine. It's all about my reward. And it's all about what I can do, um, or, or what God wants to do, do for me as if, as if that will ever work. Um, cause God already did it all. He was the one who made everything by the word of his power. He upholds this universe by the word of his power. Well, it's like, it's like we've been talking about with the deliverance guys and everything, you know, Mm -hmm. these guys say so many things, people like Joyce Meyer or Greg Locke or others, they say things that sound so enticing. They sound so good. And then what happens, this is just from my perspective, being in the church and, um, and being even in, uh, teaching Bible studies. And when you hear, when a Christian hears something new or scandalous or shocking, um, what they do would do instead of going back to God's word, we'd say, Oh, that's a new, that's a new novel idea. And so unfortunately we become enticed with that idea. Um, we don't take that to scripture and test it as we should. We are instead enticed by the idea because sadly, many times, many Christians just want to be, have their ears tickled yeah. by the latest teaching, the latest theological fad. And this is again why you must go to the Bible because if you follow and, and hear the principles that they're saying that might sound good. Some of them do. Many of them are even very close, very, very close, but you have to pay attention to the whole statement, the whole teaching, and you have to really test it against the Bible. So as we're talking about the way to avoid being fooled as I was for a a season by Joyce Meyer is to compare everything to scripture, to know the Bible, to know that it's authoritative. It's all sufficient. It's God breathed. And let's take a look at some more prosperity gospel of Joyce Meyer. 
So in the following clip, Joyce Meyer takes this verse that's all about renewing your mind through studying the Bible, and she turns it into law of attraction, the secret uh, manifesting with your thoughts. She turns it into the false New Age teaching that your thoughts create your reality. And this is the law of attraction and the secret that I unfortunately was um, fooled by when I was in the New Age before I started studying the Bible. So we're going to just take a look at this clip. And then, uh, Dave, if you could discuss how this is not what Romans 12.2 is all about. The power of thoughts and words. And I mean, the Bible tells us that we will never experience what Jesus died to give us unless our mind is completely renewed by the word, Romans 12. And um, boy, that was such an eye opener to me when I first started studying the Bible because I had no idea that, I had no idea that my thoughts or my words affected anything in my life. I mean, I went to church for years and I was never taught that. And because of being on television, we have a lot of people from a lot of different denominations that come to our conferences. And so I always try to remember that not everybody knows what some of us know, that there may be people here this afternoon that have never heard anything like that. You don't, you have no idea that negative thoughts can produce a negative effect in your life whereas positive thoughts can produce a positive. So this is something that is basic new age belief. Your thoughts create your reality. We never ever thought about God being the creator of reality <clears throat> because we, we believed that we were gods in training or goddesses in training. And Joyce Meyer teaches that. In fact, I want to just play a, real, a clip real quick of an audio of her saying that that we're little gods you know why do people have such a fit about god calling his creation his creation his man not his whole creation but his man little gods if he's god what's he going to call them but the god kind i mean if you as a human being have a baby you call it a human kind if if cattle has another cattle they call it cattle kind so i mean what's god supposed to call us doesn't the Bible say we're created in his image? Dave, help us out here. This is Joyce Meyer saying we're little gods, and there shouldn't be any problem with that. After all, and she's uh, invoking Genesis 1, that we're made in God's image, so we're little gods. That's exactly what we used to say in Christian science and also in the New Age, that we are gods because we're made by God. We're a creator because we're made by the creator. And so she's saying Romans 12, 2 is all about renewing our minds so that we can have positive thoughts to create a positive reality. Help us out here, Dave, please. Well, uh, if I flip over to, I have flipped over to uh, fl uh, Philippians 4, 8, where I'll start here. It's that uh, Paul says, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's anything of excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. The word think there has is is another way that Paul that the Bible talks about meditation. So that notice what he said. He said what is honorable, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. Those are the things we're we're to think on, to meditate on, to take them home into our heart, to be hiding them in our heart. So that, you know, we're, we're taking them home or thinking on them. And Psalm 1, the idea is, you know, to chew on it, to be processing it, to be thinking on it again and again, or even to talk to ourselves. And so when we go back to, as you mentioned, Romans, uh, or yeah, Romans 12, 2, and Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I mean, it, it kind of, and in one way, it becomes sort of obvious. Then, if if we're only to be concerned with our positive or negative thoughts, um, we all have we all have those things. We have some days we have you know uh, good days where you know we we don't have any kind of negative thoughts or whatever. But this is why we have biblical meditation. 
So she takes the idea of some things that may sound enticing. Who doesn't want help for their bad thoughts? I mean, everybody, right? Um, They're bad days. But that's why we have the word of God. (laughs) The Bible tells us how to deal with those things. That's what Paul is talking about in Philippians 4, 8, to think about those things. That's what meditation is about. It's about taking home the truth that you're reading and studying and hearing preached and chewing on it, thinking about it, meditating on it, mulling it over, bringing it home uh, even more into your life. Um, and so what, what this, but what Joyce does is she does the opposite of this. She makes it all about, um, we would say, um, like you said, law of attraction, but also it just makes it very psychologized. It's just about, and that just is a tragic because, um, you know, God is care. God cares about our thoughts. Um, he cares about our hearts. Uh, Jesus says in Luke six forty five, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's very concerned about what comes out of our mouth. Um, tr- try reading the book of James. Uh, James has much to say about this. Um, so does Paul. Um, but the thing is, is it's not first and foremost about our thoughts. What has to change, and this is where Joyce gets it wrong, what has to change is our hearts. Our heart has to be changed towards God. We were once at war with God. We were once God's enemy. And Paul says in Ephesians 2, um, but now by grace, you've been saved through faith in Christ alone. Um, And so now you are reconciled if you're a Christian and you believe that you're reconciled to God on the basis of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Uh, If you if you need another text, Romans uh, 10, uh, 9 through 17 talks about. Um, believing that Jesus died and Jesus rose and believe, confessing with your mouth and believing it in your heart and you'll be saved. Um, and the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 31, uh, Paul said to him, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Um, it doesn't get much clearer than that. Uh, believe on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. But what Joyce's teaching does is it makes it the opposite. It makes it more about psychology. Oh, well, just think about this. Just think about that. But what psycholo- modern psychology does, and you could probably speak to this even better than I could, Doreen, but what modern psychology does is it end, ends up, let's go down and see how far the problem of, of our issues are, right? Well, you're, you're never going to be able to go deep enough. <laughs> because the the more you go down, the more problems you're gonna you're gonna mm-hmm. find. That's why people get discouraged. Um, why why people struggle with their mental health because they're so focused on their problems that they can't ever look up. And this is the opposite of what the Bible does. The Bible doesn't only call us to acknowledge our sin, like Psalm fifty one. David acknowledged that he was a sinner, um, that he was born a sinner, that he was born uh, a sinner by in his very actions. Um, so not only his nature, not only at the moment of birth, but in his very decisions and the things of his life. And then, um, you know, this is why Paul in Romans 3.23 and 6.23, he talks about how all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. But then what does he do? He tells us the gospel. He doesn't leave us stuck in our sin. That's right. That's what Joyce, that's what's so dangerous about Joyce. She's telling you, think about these thoughts, think these things. This is why. So much of, and I'll say it this way, this is why so much of not only Joyce Meyer's teaching, but so much of Christian books is not helpful. They, they, they package it as self help. Here's Mm -hmm. the help. Yeah. But it, but it, it doesn't offer help because it doesn't address, it leaves the person going down and down and down and down. That's not, that's not any help. That's not addressing people's sin. No, it's Um, not. And it's not pointing them to Christ. Exactly. Yeah. So when Joyce Meyer is talking about your thoughts create positive, or negative results. And that is the law of attraction. That's the secret. And as you said, that's not the gospel. It's a false prosperity gospel. And what it does is it also, it's the devil created this so that people would not want to hear the gospel. Because when you tell the gospel to someone who's from this word of faith, name it and claim it, or new age, they hear Romans 3.23 that we're all sinners And they shut down. They say, that's so negative. They don't want to hear about Jesus on the cross because they are so afraid that if they have a negative thought, such as they're perceiving the gospel to be, 
that they will have something bad happen to them. See how superstitious they get? So she's teaching this. This is going to make people resistant to the gospel. And it's going to, it's also promising that if you have a positive thought, you're going to get a positive result. It doesn't work that way. The book of Job really slapped me on the side of the head when, when God told Job, in essence, I'm paraphrasing, where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? Where were you when I filled the ocean? And it made me, it humbled me. I needed to be humbled because the law of attraction teaching like Joyce Meyer has here, it, it puts you on the seat of the creator. It makes you a narcissist. Um, in, in 2 Timothy 4, Paul says this, starting in verse 1, charging Timothy, but we're, we're going to go past that. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, notice what verse 3 says. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths as for you always be sober-minded endure suffering do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry that is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about joyce meyer peep these people they don't want sound doctrine and so they 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 go after teachers who are going to tickle their ears. They're going to make them feel good. And you know what that, the, those teachers are going to do for you, though? They're going to send you to hell. What Jesus wants, what Jesus came for, um, Luke 19.10 says Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And John 10, what we see is he leaves the one lost sheep and he goes after the 99. Um, in Matthew one twenty one, it tells us very clearly the purpose of the incarnation, and that is that Jesus came to die for sinners. Jesus came under the sentence of death. So it's not for your hopes. It's not for your dreams. It's not for your best life now. It's not for your law of attraction. It's not for your positive thoughts or negative thoughts that Jesus came. What Jesus came to deal with was your sin. He came to really address it. That's why he came to die. He came to die for our sin and our place and for our sin and be buried and to rise again. He's coming. Uh, our text, Paul says very clearly, um, he says, after he charges Timothy in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, he says, who is to judge the living and the dead? Huh. That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to judge the living and the dead uh, because he's the only one. Uh, she talked in another clip about judging. Uh, he's going to be the one that judges. He's the one who sees our hearts. He's the one that knows our motives. He's the one that knows our thoughts. Um, he sees all. He knows all. There's nothing beyond his gaze. So he sees the thoughts that you have, even in response to what's being said now to you. He knows. He knows that, too. Um, he sees your thoughts. He knows the motives of your heart. Um, if we turn... Um, I'm going to turn here to um, Hebrews 4, uh, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, if that's not enough, notice what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Notice that there's nothing that God doesn't know. He knows the motives of your heart. He sees it all. You can't fake him out. You can't play pretend when it comes to this. He's going to judge you. He's going to judge you on the basis of whether you take his word, believe him at his word, take him at his word, and trust him um, at his word or not. So the, question is, the question is, are you going to take him at his word? Are you going to repent and believe and put your hope and trust in the only one who knows you, the one who upholds this world by the word of his power, the one who gives you life and breath? And just think about that. The very fact that your cells and your body and in your brain and in, in, in the total and down to the DNA and the molecules are functioning, um, that's God's work. 
That's right. And if that doesn't humble you enough, then you realize as well that you're going to stand before this God who does all of that and so much more. Um, you're going to give an account to him. Uh, That's right. That should cause us all, every single one, whether you're a Christian or not, that should cause us to humble ourselves and to worship the Lord mm-hmm. and to live humbly before his face, confessing our need of his grace, uh, casting ourselves upon the mercy of God in Christ alone. Amen. Yeah. And James says that teachers will be judged even more harshly. And so we should be praying for Joyce Meyer and similar false teachers, shouldn't we? I mean, if I can be saved, anyone can. So let's just take a a look at a couple more of uh, Joyce's false teachings. She, She takes Bible verses and she twists them to be positive affirmations. As you can see here, she's taken Jeremiah 29, 11, which is so often twisted anyway. And she's, she says that that is a positive affirmation. I prosper in everything I put my hand to. I have prosperity in all areas of my life, spiritually, financially, mentally, and socially. Dave, this is exactly like uh, Louise L. Hay, who was my former publisher, the late Louise Hay. She she would have people look in the mirror and say affirmations like this, but she never said that they were Bible verses. And take a look at this one too. She says, God desires to bring justice into your life. If you'll let him, he will take all of your hurts, offenses, and past pain, and he'll make it up to you. Where does it say that in the Bible? He will give you double for your trouble. I mean, she's making a cutesy rhyme, but that's not in the Bible. Not only that, he will also do a work in you. He will change you into someone who can demonstrate his authentic love, grace, mercy, compassion, and justice to a world in need. I mean, this is just stroking people's egos. This is not from the Bible. He's, you know, you could say, okay, well, we are to be more Christ-like through sanctification, but nowhere have I ever seen any of these promises that Joyce is offering to people. Yeah. It takes a principle and then applies it in the wrong way. You know, I mean, who doesn't want justice to be done against those who have been, you know, uh, hurt and crimes have been committed against them and all of those things. So it sounds good. It sounds good. Now, God will execute justice in his own time. That means that sometimes that justice is not going to come this side of heaven. And people really, really struggle with that. It's a really hard thing, um, especially if you have had you know, somebody, you know, tragically murdered in your family and those kind of, those are really hard things, but, but the Bible has something to say about that too. And, um, it's a good thing that what the Bible has to say, um, that our suffering is temporary on this side of mm-hmm. heaven, that we will be with the Lord in glory. And we may not ever have a, an exact, um, answer to, to why all the things happen other than be and beyond just the fact that we live in a post fall world. But that alone is enough that we, that, um, sin has entered the world because of our, because of our forefathers, uh, sin, Adam's sin. And we are sinners by nature and by choice. And this is why Christ had to come to deal with the problem of sin. And he has. That's why Christ is sufficient. Um, these, these words are just, they're awful. Um, it places, as I'm reading them again, it places everything about me, everything about what I want, uh, what I desire. Um, and, and it even ascribes, you let him. Oh, I can't even with that. I mean, you let him. No, we don't let him do. He does. We're talking about the almighty. We're talking about the Lord God here. We don't let God do anything. He is the one who's orchestrating all of history from beginning to end and everywhere in between. We don't let God do anything. But that doesn't mean as well, like she says, he'll take all of your hurts and offenses and past pain. Um, the Lord in Psalm 37, uh, 4, he's near to the brokenhearted. Um, he cares about our pain. We talked uh, earlier about the high priestly ministry of Jesus. Uh, this is what Jesus is there for. He He is there to help us in our time of need. Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, he's there to help you. He wants to know about your burdens and your cares and your struggles. But this goes beyond just letting him. If we just let him, that misses the point. He is. 
He is. He's there. He's a help. He's he's almighty. He's everywhere. He knows all things. He's from beginning to end. Um, and then she says, he will give you double for your trouble. I mean, that is just all bad. Um, 100% bad. Um, and then she says, then this is a good. Not only that, he, she goes on, he will also do a work in you. Uh, he will change you into someone who can demonstrate his authentic love, grace, mercy, compassion, and justice to a world in need. Again, that sounds great. Who doesn't want that, right? It's true. He's doing a work in you. But notice that the emphasis has been all wrong. Instead of placing the emphasis there's on beginning with the grace of God and how we've been saved from sin, uh, we, we were once dead in our trespasses and sins, Paul says in Ephesians 2. And now he says that we've been made alive to God through Christ. We're, and Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, we're new creations in Christ. So the emphasis is all wrong. It's not first on what grace has brought us into the family of God and then enables us to obey. It's instead all about me and mine. And, and it's just, it makes sanctification all about, you know, me and believing some empty, hollow promises uh, by declaring them. Now, the opposite of that is in the Psalms, what we see is we should be taking the truth and we should be taking our, ourselves by the hand like we see David doing and reminding ourselves of the truth and rehearsing them again and again and again and again, thinking on what is noble and good and pure and lovely in the, in the word. And so we need that. Um, but what she's, uh, what Joyce Meyer's offering is just more, you know, positivity and, and those kind of things. So it's no wonder then that people that follow her and others, they have a hard time with sin. Um, if you never talk about sin, um, you can't address your sin. Even as Christians, we have indwelling sin, remaining sin that we are to put to death by the grace of God because we've been brought in into the kingdom of God and we have the Holy Spirit and he's teaching us the truth and he's helping us to, to grow in it from his word. So true. Thank you so much, Dave. Yeah. In your book, um, The Word Matters, you talk about biblical authority and how does that apply to avoiding being fooled by false teachers um a good understanding of biblical authority it 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 um it's like a a foundation of a house right um it a foundation for your house has to be strong um like our house is is on a hill so our house has to be we have to have a really strong foundation otherwise you know if we have a mudslide or we have some sort of an earthquake god forbid uh, you know, this, the house will have issues. It'll, it'll, it'll move. And instead, what biblical authority does is it's a solid foundation. Like Jesus talks about, it's built on the rock. It's built on the rock of God's word. It's, and God's word is clear that the only way to know God is to know him as he's revealed himself in the word of God. We call that the revealed will of God. God has told us about his character, his attributes, um, the personal work of Christ, about humanity, about sin, about all of these things. Um, and so biblical authority is, is foundational. Um, and specifically the inerrancy of scripture, this, that scripture is without error. Um, the infallibility of scripture that's, uh, scripture, um, is without the possibility of error. That scripture is clear that, uh, scripture, uh, we call this the perspicuity of scripture, that scripture interprets scripture. Um, and we, we talk about how scripture points to Christ. This is the redemptive focus of scripture where we see in John 5 39 that all scripture points to Jesus. And in Luke 24 27, we see Jesus interpreting the scripture um for, you know from the old testament and and uh, and then second timothy 3 16 and 17 paul uses the you know the word inspired by god theopanustis you know that god's word are reliable and trustworthy so they're they're enough i mean uh jesus quotes jesus uses the tense of a verb uh to to you know establish the authority of scripture if jesus can use a tense of a verb um if jesus can say um, you know, in Matthew 5, 17 through uh, 20, what he does about um, all of scripture and the law, 
um, then, you know, scripture, scripture is enough, not to mention you know, Jesus quotes the Old Testament repeatedly in his teaching again and again and again. Uh, we've talked on the show before about, um, you know, Jesus in the desert uh, facing, um, you know, Satan. He says it's written. I mean, just, just that reference alone, it is written. He establishes the authority of, you know, the Old Testament and, uh, the whole Bible is inspired by God. Um, so we'll say that this way. What the, what the, what the reliable, the understanding of the inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility, um, and oh, sufficiency that scripture is for our life and godliness. Um, what this does, inerrancy, infallibility, sufficiency, clarity, authority, is it make sure that we're, our lives are grounded, like I mentioned, on the foundation that God has given to us. And that foundation provides a way in which we can stand up against these false teachers. It provides the only way because um, we'll, we'll talk about this, I'm sure, here in, in a few minutes. But what this does is it helps us um, to, to stand against air and against all these things. And, um, you know, we're facing, um, you know, you you've, we've talked many times, we know, everybody knows about uh, false teachers, about the New Apostolic Reformation, against new age um this is how we this is how we can do that because we have an objective standard over and against um a subjective standard Uh, the objective standard being god's revelation now the objective the objective standard of god's word is to impact our subjective experience but notice what i said it's first the objective impacting the subjective not the subjective impacting the objective and the difference is everything because if you if you don't have the objective standards of god's word you're not going to be able to have a right understanding of god you're not going to be able to do as proverbs the proverbs talk again and again to fear the lord and and, and ecclesiastes 12 uh, 14 talks about how solomon says that we're to fear god and to keep his commandments how are you going to do that um w- without a right understanding of god um establishing the word um, the, so the only way to know God is to know him as he's revealed in the word. And this is, this is how we can counter all these false teachings and false movements and false philosophies that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God uh, with the authority of scripture. And if you want to know more about what Dave was just talking about, I know he talks at a seminarian level. Sometimes you might under, not understand some of the words he's using. That's okay. Um, It's a, it's a learning curve. So his book, The Word Matters, and I've got the link in the description below, really helps to explain this. Dave is a very clear teacher. So, um, you know, if you just didn't understand everything he said just now, go get his book. He breaks it down very simply. Joyce takes Bible verses and makes them into, as you've been saying, all about me, uh, all about her, all about these false promises. So she takes Jeremiah 29, 11 which is so twisted all the time. And that was, uh, that was about the exiles in Babylon that God knows the plans for them. But so many times you see that verse as a, 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 a used it like a promise that you're going to have your dreams come true. I wonder if you could talk about that. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then he, Jeremiah says in verse 12, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek with me with all your heart. Verse 14, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations in all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. You know, we need to remember why they were in exile in the first place. It was because of their disobedience. God kept reminding them again and again and again, I'm the Lord. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And what did they continue to do? They continued to forget. They, the Lord continued to send um, judges. He continued to send people to help them. And that they still did not want to obey. Um, Jesus talks about that as 
a stubborn and stiff necked people, right? That's exactly what's happening here. Um, and when we take that, we, and we, we just quote that particular text, what we forget even there is the Lord is concerned that the people of Israel, they seek him, um, so they can find him, so they can know him. And so even in the midst of, you know, great judgment that God would send upon the people of Israel, um, he is still a merciful God. He is still telling his people there is still yet time to repent um, and avoid the consequence of your sin. That's that that just think about that for a minute. Even in the midst of the consequence of our sin, there's grace. That doesn't minimize the consequence of the sin. It gives grace. It gives help to address not only the root issue, but also to deal with the consequences of it. Um, that That is only something that God could do, the God who made us, the God who loves us so much that he sent his only son to die and to pay the penalty for us in our place and for our sin. And I just think, again, that goes beyond, well, beyond the word of faith, name it, claim it, uh, believe it. Um, you'll be healed. You'll be helped. You'll, you'll get whatever you want now. And, and, and this time, well, you know, we began talking about uh, Galatians 6 and all that. And I quoted from Second Corinthians 4.17. Um, there is going to be hardship. There is going to be hard times. There is going to be suffering in our life. But realize what God is doing in the midst of that. He's helping you to grow to be like Christ. One of my mentors calls this, God hand tailors the situations of our lives. And he does that. He's using those situations in our life to do, as Paul says in Romans 8, 28 and 29, to help us to conform more into the image of Christ. Um, you know, James 1, 2 through 3 is, is great. Consider it pure joy, brothers, when you face trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And we're to consider that a joy. And in the midst of it, we're to learn the lessons that we need to learn and, and ultimately not dwell on them, but to learn from them by looking to Jesus as Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 talks about. So, uh, don't despair in the midst of your suffering and, and uh, affliction. Learn the lessons that God has for you. Ask what. Ask other people. What is the Lord teaching me through this? Ask yourself. What is the Lord teaching me through this? And and read the Bible. Learn about these things. Learn from Joseph. Learn from Daniel. Learn from these guys. But don't make them your model. They only point ahead to Christ. Um, so they can teach you a lot about how to face suffering, but the, ultimately you have to look to Jesus, the apex or goal of, of all of scripture uh, to get the help that you need. Very helpful. My guest today has been Dave Jenkins. Here's a photo taken by his lovely, amazing wife, Sarah Jenkins, of his new book, The Word Matters. And I've got the link in the description below so that you can pick up this book. Either you can get the electronic version or the physical version and, and learn about the authority of scripture, learn how to defend the Bible like an apologist and so much more. All of his books are so edifying. And I want to thank you, Dave, for being with me today. Um, because I wished I had watched a video like this before I got involved with. Joyce Meyer. Of course, I want to give a shout out and, a, and credit to Pastor Chris Rosebro of Fighting for the Faith. When I I don't remember how I found his video about Joyce Meyer. It could have, you know, of course, it's God's providence always. But I think I might have had a hint that she was a false teacher and maybe went online and, and asked the question, is she a false teacher? But whatever I got there, I watched uh, Pastor Chris Rosebro and Fighting for the Faith's video about Joyce Meyer. So I'm going to put a link to his video in that uh, description below also. I want to thank you, Dave, for your books, for your teachings, your podcasts, and for breaking down how we can avoid being fooled by false teachers like Joyce Meyer today. Thank you, sister. It's always good to be with you. And I'm thankful for uh, all the many ways in which the Lord is using you as well. Oh, God bless you. All glory to God. Thank you for listening to this episode of Contending for the Word. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, 
and follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, or X. We appreciate your support.